Uh, hi, this is the follow-up for the video in which I talk a little about, about the uh, PPN formalism and how that uh, affects the theory I've been working on. So in, in this video, I want to talk about the process that I've been um, involved in trying to get a, a short letter slash article published on this on this thing and get a conversation going. And uh, um, uh, yeah, I'm trying to, I, I've been sending this manuscript um, all over the place. I've counted like, uh, I'm already at the, the mark of four attempts, all of which have been rejected. And as, as you can imagine, I'm not really um, that pleased about it. But instead of turning this into a ranging session, which I believe it would be incredibly boring and counterproductive, I thought it would be better to try and explain a little bit more about the situation on the on the sort of academic world and how how certain suppositions or assumptions that we take for granted are not really that simple and straightforward. And really, really sort of sketch a kind of critique of all that's going on around here. Okay, okay, let me try and put it like this. Uh, I have no critics concerning this research of mine, and for a very simple reason, because nobody knows why, and I just have nobody, and I can get even like a hundred views because I'm not really the most charismatic fellow, and I don't speak really in a very clean and, and uh, very clean fashion, let's say. But if I had said critics, I know exactly what would be the rock and foundation for their criticism. It would be basically this: Oh, you've sent your paper to? Did you send your paper to peer review already? And if you didn't, if you got rejected, well, I suppose it's just garbage because that's the point of the peer review system. If you send the paper and it gets rejected, then it's just garbage and hear it, end of story. I would like to submit to you that there's a little more to it than that. And to understand the point that I want to make here, to understand the underlying thesis, you gotta understand this diagram over here, this, this Venn diagram that I wrote over here. We've got basically three entities that they're interconnected. One will be science, letter S, the academia, letter A, and the publishing industry, represented by people. The first and most important point that we need to keep in mind here is that these are different entities. They are not uh, completely overlapping, nor they are identical. To say that they are identical would be a category error, which is surprisingly common and frighteningly so, because it's very common for people, for instance, to make a critique of something in the academic world. And when, when someone says that, People understand that they are attacking the scientific um, side of things. So, for when someone criticizes academia, they come across they almost immediately sometimes come across as anti-science or denialists or contrarians or something like that. And this is very dangerous and very uh, misleading. So, of course, of course, if we admit this possibility that science is something different than academia, then of course there's some overlap, but the region there is non-overlapping. We can we can ask ourselves, how are we supposed to think about it? Um, sorry, uh, there's a mouth over there. Never mind. But anyway, um, we can think of this the little slice here of the sets as, which I've, let's call it F, as a region that is not academic, but it's still scientific. And um, this is what I, would, I personally would refer to as fringe science. Because people use this term disparagingly, but to me, free science is simply um, doesn't in the definition, it must be scientific. It's not mainstream science because that would be academia, the academic science, but uh, it's still science. It's not science, then something else like pseudoscience. And indeed, people use the term interchangeably, but to me, free science is science still. Pseudoscience is not science, it just seems to be, it just gives you appearance of science, this false science. But this is sort of like my opinion, because if you ask someone in academia, they say, no, there is no such thing. They're just academia and they're nothing. So effectively, what they're saying is that academia is identical to science. And you, you have to question that because it's sort of like it goes in their interest, right? Because what they're doing here is essentially is to say, it's kind of like a meme. Like uh, some people say, that's what is science? Science is what scientists say, what scientists do. But then when you extend that and to basically uh, say that science is what scientists say, you're in very dangerous territory because you, you are basically turning them into oracular figures, into they'll find um, archetypes that can sort of, whatever they say goes is true, or whatever they, they say must be upheld. 
and questioning me essentially because they are experts. Well, let's just backtrack a little, a little bit because I'm trying to say this in the context of I, I'm I'm being criticized by my non-existent critics because I haven't been peer reviewed yet. So it is, I, I care about getting peer reviewed, getting published in a peer reviewed uh, journal, but I don't care about that for reasons that people may think I want. Maybe they think, oh, I just want the prestige of getting published or I want to be a member of the club. I want to be seen as something smart and so on and so forth. Well, that's not really the reason. The reason rather is because I want feedback, essentially. See, I, I don't care about academia nor about the publishing industry. So I've been, I've been a little while in academia. I, I have a college degree, okay? I don't know if I mentioned this in a previous video, but I am a bachelor, I'm a bachelor of science. I am in, specialized in chemistry. And I, for a little while, I've been in a master's program in physics, but I, for a number of reasons, I didn't finish. And maybe we can talk about this a little uh, later. But the, the short of it is that I'm familiar with the academic medium, and I don't miss this. I don't miss that medium just a, a, a tiny bit. I don't care about it. I just, just only care about the science. So how, how they are different, right? How they are at a metaphysical level, because I say they are not the same thing, and say that they are is a category mistake. Well, I'll say that because science is not like a, a thing or in the sense of a place or an object, like say this bottle over here that I'm holding. Science is, little, is, is really an epistemic stuff, uh, an epistemic kind of thing. Like it, it's about knowledge, knowledge about things in the world. Okay, so it's a little bit abstract. Whereas academia is more tangible. We're talking about universities, we're talking about professors and teachers and uh, the technicians that work in the laboratories there. The, the laboratories themselves will have libraries and the administrative faculty and so on and so on and so forth. So all of that is quite tangible and visible. Science less so, because it's not necessarily attached to an institution. There is there's really no place like on Earth, on planet Earth, that you can sort of draw a circle on the sand and say inside the circle there is science and outside the circle there is no science. Um, that, that's really not a thing. In the same way that you can do that with arithmetic, like um, this is the place where the laws of arithmetic come from. And outside there is none, so it's sort of like a, a desert of ignorance or something. There is no such thing. And people trying to capitalize on that, they either they don't know what they're talking about, or they do know what they, what they are talking about, but they are trying to capitalize on the on the, the, the prestige of science because you're speaking on with the authority of science, which from an epistemic uh, perspective does carry some weight, right? Science works. That's why people are all over it. And but there there is also something called uh, which we may call blue sky science, which is really uh, knowledge for the law of knowledge. Right? It's sort of like a philosophical thing, which I think has a, also its merit, but it's, it's definitely an abstract thing, right? So what's the, the relation between the two? The relation is that often is the case that they carry, they, they, they go hand to hand very often. Like most of the science that has been done in the last few centuries have been associated with academia, that's true. But why is that? That is because simply academia as a sociological and economical institution or or collection thereof, uh, provides a lot of resources for people who are trying to do science. Because like I mentioned, to do science, you can do that uh, in a vacuum, or, or rather, to do science, you need stuff, like you need resources, okay? On the experimental side of things, you need things like telescopes and microscopes and laboratories, and you need chemicals. It all depends on the interest area, but um, you need laboratories, you need uh, facilities and people to manage those things. You need, uh, maybe you can, you also have to outsource some of that work of managing these things. So you need technicians and, and a whole staff to take care of the, those things. Because science has this empirical uh, need. But on the other hand, on the theoretical um, side of things, we can talk of other kinds of resources, such as libraries, which have, which give you access to, sorry, so you know, Published journals as well as books. So having access to a library is itself a kind of resource. And unless you're like rich or something, you're not going to have a sophisticated personal scientific library because uh, scientific volumes of cost a lot of money. So you want to have access to that through, say, university, which is like the typical thing. And but you speak of journals, you also want to have access to, to journals through subscription which costs money. So you either subscribe to a journal or you pay uh, on an article by article basis, which is simply unfeasible economically because if you look up many journals, many prestigious journals, your average article is like 30 or $40 American dollars a pop. 
even if it's just a short little letter or something. And even if you just want to like have a quick read because you just need to check something, check a little calculation or um, confirm a certain source or something like that, citation or something like that. You, you don't need the whole thing. You just need a quick, a quick uh, check. Uh, you still have to pay. You're, you're supposed, legally speaking, to pay full price. But there are other ways that people get around the things, but they are not technically legal. So there's this caveat as well. So, so anyway, what I'm trying to say is uh, science costs money and a lot of it. So you need some kind of patronage, and it typically comes in the form of university system, which is why, once again, academia has been historically tied association with the overall scientific production. But this is just like an economic thing. It's not uh, an economic accident. It's not a, an article of necessity. And as I say, there, there is this visible thing, academia, which is, is university system, but also comprised of the industry. Like there's, there are scientists that work on industry as well, and they're sort of like part of academia in a sense. All of this is visible and tangible, but there's a more abstract and uh, let's say ethereal aspect of the knowledge that is generated in this way. Speaking of the theoretical side of things, the journals and so on, uh, a little outside the, the academic system, we might identify the publishing system. And wh why I say that? Because there's a very important thing people don't emphasize a lot, especially in a public discussion, but some scientists do talk about these things, is that we have the publishing arm of the scientific journals, which scientists need for doing their research and their job. And uh, it's very important to stress that these are not charities. Like these are part of the private sector. In other words, the publishing industry, as the name implies and suggests, is supposed to be making money. And it's true that the marketing there, marketing is rather niche, right? Right? It's the scientific marketing. There's not a whole lot of demand for it. If you compare it with the more popular demands of, I don't know, a fashion magazine or um, something like cable TV. I don't know the, the news, the news in the newspaper or the or the cable TV or whatever public TV. But still, it's a it's a it's about make money, right? And money they do make. So I, I don't have the source right here with me right now, but uh, if you look up, you have this so-called big five so companies like yeah, Xavier and Wheelie and so on. And when you look at the bottom line, right, after other expenses and so on, these big companies, they managed to make more money overall than giants of the economy, the global economy, such as Apple and Google. So we're talking like billions and billions out of this rather niche market. market. And that's really important to emphasize because, see, if you go back to the original um, issue, which is, oh, you having, you, you Mr. Uh, independent Research, indie researcher, you're having trouble to get published. We're talking about here, right? We're talking about the, the, this money-making uh, leg of the system, which has indeed tight connection with the academic world because the scientists make use of their product, let's say. So kind of like Miri, the the phrase uh, the military industrial complex we may talk of a academic publishing complex right because these journals they are like other journals they have say editors and these editors since these are um, scientific journals they are typically scientists themselves and sometimes very well regarded and respected scientists and not to mention of course that you probably know about the peer review system that the reviewers are also scientists. The journal basically calls upon an expert of the field of a submission, the topic of a certain submission. And theoretically, the reviewer, who is an expert of the field, he assesses, he or she assesses that, sees if it has merit uh, in the sense of there's no plagiarism, there's no issue like um, obviously flawed arguments and so on. Basically, they are giving their okay and, and, and seeing if there's nothing obviously wrong with the with the thing. What I try to say is the overall idea, the theoretical idea here is that this is about quality control, right? This is how they are supposed to do in thesis. But what about in practice? In practice, since this scheme is somewhat um, it lacks transparency, let's say, it, it's liable to all sorts of abuse. And this is a kind of thing that we got to be a little little cautious because, again, it's the same thing with uh, equating academia with science, because if you criticize academia, then someone will 
uh, attack you, saying that you're against science and so on. Here, I'm not talking about, uh, I'm not trying to make a conspiracy theory. I'm just saying that the system is what it is. And there are other people than me who have been subject to abuse. If, if you think about it, when you ask if a certain system is being um, liable to corruption, it's not like you can go to that system, the, the centralized office or whatever, and just ask, oh, have you been uh, involved in any corruption lately? Any any kind of fraud? And because obviously they are going to deny it, even if they are indeed uh, involved in some kind of malfeasance. So the problem is that we can be scientific about it. The best we can do is collect anecdotes as evidence that this is really happening. And, and we can also analyze the system. The, the publishers themselves, they don't actually care a lot about um, how the review occurs as far as the review is concerned, because uh, really what they are doing with the review process is sort of like covering for their own assets, because they don't want to, to um, publish crap that is then later shown to be false, because this would diminish their credibility, credibility in the eyes of the greater uh, scientific community. And they are the ones buying their product, so basically bad publicity. And they don't want that. Right. One example was the so-called SoCal affair, in which a physicist trying to publish what it amounted to essentially a bounce, a bunch of God of the book in a, I think, a social science journal. They have accepted and published, and then he came out and just said, "Oh, this is just a bunch of crap that I made up just to see if I could get published this social social science things." So of course the publishers don't want that kind of publicity for themselves, and that's why they care about the peer review. The peer review, by the way, don't don't have to be that particular way because remember we care about the quality control what we don't care about what we don't care about is the gatekeeping people uh, equivocate this truth thinking that quality control necessarily means gatekeeping but that's not the case because if it were we wouldn't be able to produce new ideas more on that later because this is a very important point so what what we have here in the traditional model is what we call the pre-publication review so as the name suggests there is also a kind of post-publication review and in my opinion, that's the really important one. That's the one that really matters because if you publish like, a, let's say a wrong calculation, like let's say you're a nuclear physicist and you're calculating, and you're calculating um, scattering uh, cross-sections or something, and you, but you made a mistake. Rather than having just one person um, be responsible to check this, it will be far better and far more efficient to have like, I don't know, maybe tens, dozens, or even hundreds or potentially thousands of people perusing this published paper and detecting this error. If it's the case, they will either correct it or retract the paper completely. And the problem also with pre-publication review model is that there's often the anonymity, anonymity which can be used as um, as a shield by the reviewer. One of the, of the things that can happen is since the guy is the same is of the same field than you, he or she can look at your work and think to himself or herself, oh. That's a great idea. I, I wish I could have I would have thought of it before. So what they do, they can recommend rejection. The paper doesn't get rejected. And they themselves, they can get on working on a paper, which publishes essentially the same thing. So you don't need to be a scientist to realize that this is obviously unethical. This is um, right. This is uh, basically it's cheating. And, uh, and unfortunately, the system can provide a kind of cover to this kind of activity. And we don't like I said, it's not like we can get statistics on how often this happens. So the best we can have is a lower bound based on things on cases that leak. And we can we have to bear in mind that the statistics, the statistics here are probably way higher, or at least higher. And that's a problem. We give way too much power to the reviewer, as I will uh, indicate. Uh, let's consider my own example. I said I've been trying uh, four attempts already at publishing. So how, how did it go? In the last few months. Well, the first one, the first rejection was based on the the reasoning was that the journal that I meant that I sent the manuscript to was outside the scope of the paper or vice versa. So they say this is more like geared towards practical astronomy and your paper is more like fundamental physics. Well, I disagree a little bit because um, I've I've read a few papers before submitting and I saw a few things that are more or less within the ballpark of what I want to talk. But anyway, fair enough. Um, I can live with that decision because that's not um, that, that, that's not in bad faith. And in part, there's a prerogative because like I said, the journal is a, um, a private thing. 
at the end of the day, they can publish whatever they want. So if they wish um, tomorrow to publish something like, um, I don't know, straight up porn, would that be a wise decision? No, in many ways it wouldn't be. But if they really want to, they could. They could uh, straight up reject everything that anybody says, sends to them, that is not porn. Their prerogative, there's that truth. In that sense, they are independent of academia, as you can um, see or guess. But anyway, moving on to the next uh, submission. That was a little bit more hopeful because the editors didn't reject it out of hand. They sent to peer review. And they made me wait a month for an answer. And what I got as an answer was a very curt and very non-charitable take from the reviewer, who basically was being very condescending to me. I, I, I submitted my appeal against objecting against the comment there, the comments of the reviewer. And I didn't get the, that didn't work very well for me. In the end, I, I'm going to put the appeal in the description section so you can get an idea of what the claims of the review were and what was my my objections. I, I'm not going to rebut or try to rebut the, the that person because but let me just say this. The main issue with that take was that the person basically uh, made a straw man of what I had to say. They either didn't understand what I was talking about or they did understand, but they don't, didn't care about me getting published in this journal for whatever reason. And either case is an issue. Either case is a problem. Because, see, what happens here is that I'm getting veto based on something which I did not say. The, the, the sole uh, grounds for rejecting me was um, this attack on something which I never said, which I hope you all can see is a problem. And by the way, I think it's important to note that once I, I received that, the commentaries by this person, before I had any chance to try and defend myself against those, those critiques, those criticisms, the status of my paper was rejected. Like there's a little status thing on the website which you have to, um, to make an account and everything in order to send the manuscript. And at that point, my manuscript was rejected immediately. So I sent the appeal and I wait two weeks for an answer for a non-answer, because the only thing that I got was an email that said final rejection. So it's, it's not like, I'm not just dead, I'm not like, I'm like super dead. That's what it means, essentially. And I never got the sense that I was taken seriously because they never addressed any of my objections. So I don't know what was the final reason here. They just said, our decision stands, that's all. So end of story, moving on. So I sent to another journal. This time I waited just a few days, but the editors were the ones to reject. They gave me no reason. Like they, they sent me a big email, but there was only one sentence that say, we, we, we are going to reject your manuscript. That, that's all, no reason was provided. So, but sort of like a peace offering, they did offer to do something, which I think at least in theory is a good idea, which is to transfer the parent company uh, has other journals, other uh, titles in their banner. And they have this, this option of transferring the paper to a different journal. And maybe there they, they it can get published. The problem is that the way they did that, I got the impression that it was bumped off to a B list journal, which has lower impact factor, and it also charges APCs, which APCs is something that I'll talk about later, if you don't know what it is. But anyway, as much of a pain in the ass that was, I accepted the offer, and then I waited a, a, another week for a response, and it was even worse than. I've expected uh, and anticipated because I didn't just get an email saying that they rejected the the submission. I got essentially an advertisement for a service that they have where they charge you for people to look up a journal where you can publish, and it's not. And obviously, they are they are trying to make money, so this is not a free service. You are supposed to fork over over two hundred dollars American dollars again, which is basically like rubbing salt on an open wound. So. That's that. That's where I find myself currently. What I'm going to do is I'll keep trying. I just keep trying, submitting journal after journal. But I hope you realize that there's more to it than just, oh, your work has no worth whatsoever. If you can get it published. There are other things in motion, other things going in and this academic publishing complex. Because you see, for the academicians, the professional scientists, let's say, who do science for a living, anybody can do research. If you do research for a living, then you're a scientist. And typically, you need a degree for that, to be acknowledged as a scientist profession. But then again, people miss the point of the degrees because a diploma, a lot of people, a lot of people 
think that a diploma is sort of like a, a magic scroll that grants you the power to have a job. And that's not the point at all. That's not the point at all, especially if you're in the STEM field. Really, the, the, the idea, the, the let's say the platonic idea of the diploma is the following thing. It acknowledges that you have amassed the skills to perform your um, intended job. So for instance, if you want to be a scientist, you gotta know your science. You gotta have some experience in the laboratory and reading the, the literature and, and so on and so forth. A bunch of skills that you accumulate. And it's the skills that matter, not the piece of paper. The piece of paper is only like a marking. It's sort of like a mark that tells, yes, you do have the skills. So you can trust this guy that they have, that he or she has the skills to do this thing. And if you think about it, like in terms of medicine, why do you want your surgeon to have six years of medicine, medical college? When we can just print paper that says, here's a doctor of medicine, and then you sell this to people and they can hang that on their walls, their offices, and say, oh, I'm a medical doctor. Here's my degree, but you can trust me. And the magical piece of scroll, it says so. So you can argue with that. Think about that in terms of who do you want to cut you open and then put you back together? Do you want something skilled with years and years, preferably of practice, or something, some, some novice who, whose hand shakes at the mere sight of blood? And this is where the skill really enters the story. That's what matters. Likewise, when you send a paper, what should matter, it's a scientific paper, is whether or not it has merits. It's whether or not this, this paper is playing, so to say, by the rules of science, of the scientific method, and it has rigor. This is sort of like the ideal thing. But in practice, what happens is, since the scientists uh, need to pay their bills, and they do their science for a living, they're not going to necessarily be interested in producing knowledge. Rather, and this is, again, another point that people will take like a conspiracy theory or whatever, but it's just the economic reality of the thing, especially after the post-war, World War II. The way that the academic world in the West and also in other parts of the East as globalization takes hold of everything, the way that it has been conducted, since a lot of people has flooded the stand market and essentially made it a saturated and highly competitive one. Not that it wasn't competitive beforehand, it was, but it also was a smaller world. Like you had few um, positions and if you have few positions, even just a handful of people will be competing against one another. But even if you have a lot of positions available, or at least theoretically available, if you have a lot of people in that marketing, they will be competing over that. So the way they compete nowadays is by producing is basically what you, you see, for instance, in the movie industry. They play safe. So what they do, they uh, let's introduce here a Kenyan work. If you know the word of the work of the philosopher of science Thomas Kuhn, he, he talks about this thing called normal science. Normal. Well, what that means. Let, let me give you an example. There's this thing called spectroscopy, which is like I think taught, the basic principles can even be taught at the freshman or even perhaps high school level. And the principles have been known for like over a century or so, which is to say, it's basically a, a bunch of techniques meant to characterize a fingerprint, so to say, for a chemical substance or compound. If you have like a pure compound, you can use spectroscopic methods to, to tell it apart from other compounds. So you can use this in the end of the day as a form of, uh, as an analytical tool to understand what your sample is made of. And this is well and nice and well established. So what you can do with that? Um, as people either synthesize in the laboratory or extract from, say, plant material, more and more compounds, you can just make basically a career out of, you take that compound and then you analyze it spectroscopically and then you publish papers about it. And this is a way, this is a perfect legitimate way to make science. You have a scientific, steady scientific output and uh, you can get a tenure position, you can get awards, you can get respect basically of your peers, et cetera, et cetera. Very straightforward, very risk adverse, but also not terribly interesting because you see, this is one way in which science can grow, but it's not the more exciting way, especially if you consider there are a lot of gaps in scientific knowledge nowadays. For instance, uh, people have trouble in physics trying to connect uh, general relativity or gravitation in general with um, quantum theory. And indeed, this is one of the motivations of my own research to try and um, take a different approach to that problem. But if you take this risk adverse normal science stuff as your primary way of doing things, you, it's very unlikely 
that you are going to come with the kind of breakthrough that you need to make what Thomas Kahn refers to as a paradigm shift. You have these big ideas that shift the, the way the science is taught. And the system, the way that it's set up, it essentially disfavors this kind of um, breakthrough. So essentially, it's not really in the best interest of science itself as the platonic abstract of knowledge about the natural world to do things in the way that the academia favors because there are social and economical pressures that, that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with science, which is more abstract. And this is an issue because if you want for whatever, for whatever reason to solve these problems, right? We, we want science to flourish, we really do. Then this becomes an obstacle an obstacle for the, the generation of knowledge. Let me just not uh, be beholden to myself. Let me give you an example of things that other researchers, some of which have been inside academia, have to say. Let me show you something, uh, a, a book by uh, a book that has been edited by these two guys here, Oedoira and Pedermann, as it, it collects a lot of thoughts and further anecdotes from other researchers. Sometimes people with many years of ex worth of experience they've saw these things happen and um, they have criticism of their own uh, their own experiences on this matter let me say um, I'm not really endorsing their particular research or, or even their side of the story because really we are only seeing their side of the story here but I think uh, this is valid criticism this is the kind of thing that we should keep in mind because uh, if it's true, if that side of the, the story is true, then it's blatantly scandalous, to say the least, and not in the conspiratorial kind of way. But it's essentially like uh, academia, even though it claims to, make, to be making and producing science, it's really not producing a lot of science, especially not the interesting kind of science that has been delivering in the past. Even in the first half of the 20th century, we have great breakthroughs like the special and general theories of relativity and quantum mechanics and so on. Big breakthroughs, right? Actual science was being made and actual science is still being made, but not the same kind. And even though there's a very large output of papers, which is a subject that I think is best left for another video because this one is already way too long and I, I stammer a lot, so I have to uh, edit this considerably. Anywho, I recommend that you check out this book if you can. And um, this PDF that I have, I think I found uh, a while ago in a website made by this, these editors. I think they were giving it all for free. I don't think that's still the case. You have to buy a copy, but I think it's worth your, your while because um, they talk about stuff that you don't hear in the mainstream medium. And I, I think it's important to keep in mind if you want science to really flourish, as we often claim to say. Because here's the thing, everyone says that they are on the side of science, but when push comes to chove, to chove, and especially when you know how the sausage is made, it's really not the case. Really, not a whole lot of people are interested and invested in the progress of science. They just pay lip service to it. And I don't want to, all of this to just be me trying to rationalize my own failure. It's more like me trying to get you thinking about the, the social implications of how science is produced and how the academia uh, is accountable, and so on and so forth. I, I just want you to get a discussion, a respectful discussion to start and say, look, just because I'm an independent researcher, I don't deserve to be condescended to, right? Because of those four rejections that I got, not one of them was based on technical grounds, like someone objecting to this is a wrong calculation or your argument here is incorrect. Nobody ever saw that to me. Uh, nobody ever told that to me, which strongly indicates to me that uh, I, I'm not necessarily on the wrong here, right? Maybe I am, and maybe this whole research project of mine is just a dead end. But this is a possibility for any kind of research. You don't know beforehand. You're sort of like on the cutting edge of things. You're trying to, you're in terra incognita. You are trying to make new discoveries and so on. If you already knew what you were going to discover, then it wouldn't be a discovery, right? So the, the, what, what you have to, what you can't keep in sight here is whether or not uh, logic, the, the math is accurate and so on. These are things that we can check. But short of that, we shouldn't really be gatekeeping things and say, you're only allowed to research things on this circle. Anything outside is anathema. This is not really productive. 
and leads to all sorts of um, prejudice and disguise as science. And I apologize for for the very non eloquent uh, lecture that I just gave here. But um, maybe when I get the better uh, oratorial skills, I will revisit this thing, write in the script and so on, and trying to convey this thing better. So for, for the time being, at least, I'll see you guys later. Thank you very much for watching this very long thing. God bless.